Gregory Boyd is here. He is an evangelical pastor, theologian, and author. Last month, the New York Times published a front-page article about Pastor Boyd. The headline read, Disowning Conservative Politics, Evangelical Pastor Rattles Flock. The story was so widely read that Boyd's latest book jumped in sales rank from 33,000 to 20 on Amazon. His book is called The Myth of a Christian Nation, How the Quest for Political Power is Destroying the Church. I am pleased to have him on this program. It's Welcome. Here. No, it's great to have you. Tell me that, I'm going to talk about the book in a sense, but what is it you think so resonated uh, towards the sales of books, towards emails to you from a front page story on the New York Times about your message? It seems they've hit a chord, and I, I think uh, the essence of it is that there's a lot of people and a lot of Christians, a lot of conservative Christians who are um, really beginning to get tired of the way that uh, large segments of conservative Christianity have fused together their faith in politics. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of people who have, you know, kind of really jumped on the conservative political bandwagon several years back that are really kind of having a moment of conscience and really asking the question, is it really good to fuse our faith, to identify our faith so strongly with any particular political cause or agenda? And um, so, I, yeah, I think it's, there's, it's, there's kind of a moment for this. The cord. And what are you telling them? Well, the message that I uh, have in the book, Myth of a Christian Nation, it came out of a series that I preached several years ago in response to some of the pressure I was getting. I'm a conservative evangelical pastor and was getting quite a bit of pressure to shepherd my flock in the way that they should vote or whatever. And so I just wanted to use that as an occasion to really clearly state why uh, I and the church uh, that I'm a part of won't do that. And the essence of it is this, um, the, the kingdom that we're called to represent and build, the kingdom that I believe Jesus came to establish, is a kingdom, the heart of which looks like Jesus Christ, dying on Calvary for the people who crucified him. Uh, it's a kingdom that expands by loving service, uh, by replicating Calvary to all people at all times and all situations, no ifs, ands, and buts. And so the kingdom always looks like Jesus. It doesn't look like the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or America or any other nation. It, it's, as Jesus said in, in John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. And I think protecting the uniqueness of the one thing that Christians are called to do is all important. The minute we start fusing it with other things, we compromise it. How do you think it happened that so many, quote, evangelical Christians began to move towards politics and may well, because they voted in larger numbers, percentages, have affected the 2004 election. Oh yeah, well, there's there's really a long tradition of this. I think it's a long, sad tradition of this, going back to Constantine in the fourth century. Up to that point, uh, Christians had seen it as their uh, job, their mission, to follow the example of Jesus, and they were content doing that. But as soon as the Christians got in power, uh, we basically became sort of just another religious version of the kingdoms of the world. And there's something about us, about all people, that likes power. It's a lot easier to, to uh, uh, you know, have power over people and control people than it is to sacrifice and serve them. And um, so I think that what's happened recently is simply uh, a more intensified version of what's been there all along in American history. And really it goes back, uh, you know, to a large degree throughout history. But did politicians move in and see the connection? Or did oh, people sure. like Pat Robertson and others... Uh, with Ralph Reed and people who began to understand that they could take the message that they saw and use it in politics to achieve what political objective they thought were in oh, the sure. Christian mission. Well, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, and I, I don't even fault politicians for doing that. Um, you know, to use religious rhetoric that will, uh, you know, garner votes from a religious segment, that's just smart politics. I don't fault the politicians for doing that at all. What grieves me is that so, such large segments of the church don't notice that that's what's going on. And so they get co-opted into this political agenda, and they think it's then their job to sort of decide which of the limited options that the pol political regime gives you, uh, w which of them is the Christian position, and then Christians fight over which one's the political position, and then we make the same kind of enemies politics always makes, and it's just uh, it's, it's a sad thing. So I'm not at all surprised that politicians will use biblical language and religious rhetoric. In fact, throughout American history, politicians have done that. I just really wish, and part of the reason why I wrote this book, is to help Christians to wake up as to sort of what's going on and to reclaim uh, the kingdom that we're supposed but, to be building. But if they say, if they say, I, I believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible, and the Bible is what has been my guide, 
and therefore I take these political actions because I believe it is what Jesus wanted me to yeah. as described by his sure a his I say amen to that I, I, take the Bible more seriously because if you look at uh, and this is my man I'm preaching my sermon here <laughs> I think, uh, it, Jesus never once allowed the politics of his day to set his agenda and what's amazing is that people he was in a real political hot time and people were constantly trying to get him to weigh in on the various hot political issues of his day and never once did he uh, bite the bait as it were uh, he would always turn their their kingdom of the world questions into his unique questions he said he didn't come here to give us to the right version of the kingdom of the world or to tweak the government whatever he came to establish a radically different kingdom that always looks it looks like Jesus instead of Caesar and uh, so it, you know precisely because I believe in the Bible I am absolutely insistent that the kingdom he came to establish can be easily fused in fact ever fused with the king uh, any version of the kingdom of the world of the world yeah. All right, let me let me talk a little bit about your biography you're the founder and senior pastor at Woodland Hills Church in st. Paul Minnesota founder and pastor senior pastor also the founder and president of, of Christus Victor Ministries for 16 years he was a professor of theology at Bethel College in St. Paul, graduated the University of Minnesota, Yale Divinity School, and the University and Princeton Theological Seminary. When you came out of all that education, what did you want to do? Well, I wanted to change the world for Jesus Christ. I Is mean, that right? Yeah, that, that was my, my passion, and I love to teach. I love to read and research and put things together and package it and help people get free and uh, and, and to call the church to be what the church is supposed to be. Did you come out of the theological seminary as an evangelical Christian, or is mm -hmm. that a definition that, that has no meaning anymore? Well, I really question whether it has much meaning anymore, uh, and so I'm, I'm hesitant. I, I like to first find out what people mean by it when they ask, are you an evangelical? And I'm always like, well, that depends yeah. what you mean yeah. by it. But I, I've always understood myself. I, I see myself as a conservative, Bible-believing Christian, uh, and I, you know, submit my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and believe in the inspiration of the Bible and want to do all I can do to expand the beautiful kingdom uh, that Jesus came to establish. Does that belief that you have in Jesus affect your opinion, your views on abortion, gay marriage, other hot button social issues oh, which become part of the political debate? Absolutely, a absolutely. It, it's, it goes to the core of my being, my whole view of life, everything about me is is uh, infused with my faith in in Christ as it should be for 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 any Christian. So your faith in Christ says what to you about abortion, and, for example? Yeah, for me, I mean, I, I'm pro-life to the core. I, uh, you know, I'm pro-life in the womb, after the womb. Uh, in my whole view of, I, I see law of life as sacred. I'm opposed to all forms of violence. The point I'm making in this book, however, is this: it's simplistic to think that because you have this. Uh, conviction because of your faith in Christ that that easily and without any ambiguity translates into a particular vote good and godly and decent people Bible believing people can fundamentally disagree about how to what's best for society at this time um, how do you weigh the different issues the different candidates uh, how do they stand on poverty issues because that also affects life and war that also affects life and there's no unambiguous way to translate that and so the, my the book is a call for the church to be the church. Uh, for example, here's something. Uh, well, whatever, whatever for the person, church to be the church means what to you? To look like Jesus. To look like Jesus serving the world. We don't have to answer all of society's questions. Uh, but but if, if you were pro-life to the core, should you be out uh, expressing that? point of view in every way possible in every way possible sure now but, what shouldn't you do then well I think slap the label Christian on a candidate because of the way that uh, he votes on on, on uh, the pro-life or issue. telling other Christians that they should, that should you tell other Christians that you're not really a Christian unless you vote this particular way see that is uh, there's uh, there's a, a, a an enormous amount of complexity that goes into any political stance there's a, 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 an enormous amount of complexity that goes into any political stance. For example, one could argue that, that uh, um, one could argue, I'm not saying this is my position, but that the main problem with, um, uh, that's costing the lives of, of unborn today is the polarization in society, because most Americans uh, agree 
that the fewer the abortions, the better. But we're not working together necessarily to attain that end because we're polarized. So it could be the case that the way to get the least of what you want is by insisting on everything that you want. You're actually beginning, to see, you're you're beginning to see some change in terms of people who are strongly pro-choice, not changing their deeply held views about choice and women's choice, but also tending to look at the debate and say the debate is getting us is getting in the way of what's best for mm -hmm. people. And I think there's a people I, on the left are saying that. Sure, and, and th see, there's a unique kingdom of God way. I have a, 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 a section in the book that's on this. A unique way that fits the pattern of Jesus uh, about addressing this issue. I don't have to answer all the metaphysical and ethical and problematic issues uh, that society has on this uh, uh, on the abortion debate. For me to say, church. Uh, let's get together and let's do what we can do, sacrifice of our lives, to make it feasible for a woman to go full term. Uh, to ascribe worth to her and to her unborn, it's easy for us to say you shouldn't do this. Uh, but that's not something Jesus ever did, where you just pass a law, but rather you come under people, you serve them, to make it viable and feasible for them. Let me understand now, go back to the title of this book, sure. The Myth of a Christian Nation, yeah. which, as you have been articulating, says that Jesus was not what people and people taking messages from Jesus that are not necessarily what you and other people believe about the Jesus that, that you see. Uh, it also is how the quest for political power is destroying the church, mm -hmm. meaning those people who want political power are destroying the church because it is driving away God-fearing people. Not, I never like that expression anyway, God-fearing God -fearing people. You know, yeah. it's, it's driving away people sure. who love Jesus and love the church or and love would, the act they, of the message yeah. because it is mixing with politics. Yeah, um, that's part of it. Um, it you know, we're not present, it, Jesus is beautiful and the kingdom of God is beautiful, but we, the large segments of the church have done a good job of making it very, very ugly. Um, but it, it goes deeper than that. Uh, the way I put it in the book is this. Um, you can't uh, pick up the sword, which is the power to control, without putting down the cross. But everything in, in the gospel and in the New Testament hangs on us carrying the cross. In other words, our way of transforming the world and transforming others is to be through replicating what Jesus does, coming under them rather than trying to control them. And the minute we pick up the cross and think it's our job to fix people with laws and, and policies and maybe bombs and guns, uh, we, we, we can no longer uh, carry the cross the way we're commanded to carry it. New York Times clearly added to your own reach and to your fame and to uh, 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 your message. Clearly. Yeah. Did it not? I mean, yeah. book sales went up and, and more and more people knew you because you read it and, and it was translated. Was there a negative reaction? Did oh, other sure. people look at it? And what was their complaint about you? Well, you know, I, I was, I'll say this. So far, so far, and I expect this to change, but so far it's been overwhelmingly positive. Okay, I'll accept that. Um, but there are some, and when I first preached my sermon series... Um, Tell them about uh, the sermon series before you go and come back to this point, because you've mentioned it a couple of times. Sure, the sermon series was called The Cross and the Sword. Uh, it's a six-part series that I, I preached in 2004 before the election. And roughly a thousand people in my congregation left. Uh, they just in were... In a congregation of how many? Five thousand. Okay, so twenty percent. About twenty percent of our people left. And they left uh, for, you know, I, I guess the, the major reason is that for many people, I, some I think just didn't understand what I was saying. Some are, were, are, their mindset is so politicized that if you're not supporting the right-wing political cause, you must be a liberal. And so they assumed that I was sneaking in liberal politics. You don't sound like When I'm trying to, I'm not. I'm trying to say that the kingdom of God is beautiful and it transcends this partisan political stuff. But some people just couldn't hear it. And... Um, and then others just flatly disagree. Uh, their faith is so strongly wedded to uh, American nationalism and to right-wing politics that uh, for their pastor to say, you know, that this is not what we're about is, you know, to go AWOL. And so in anger uh, or in frustration, they What's left. the response? We look today at a time in, in our own history in which there's enormous tension coming out of the Middle East in yeah. part. Uh, but also in Asia and other parts of the world, in terms of uh, the hatred of radical, Muslim, violent, fundamentalist sure. for the West, for Israel, for America, mm -hmm. for Christianity. Right. What's the role of the Christian in response to that? First and foremost, to do the one thing that very few people, very few other people on the planet are going to do, and that is 
uh, to refuse to retaliate, to love your enemies, to do good to those who persecute you, to bless those who uh, intend you harm, uh, to never return evil, but to return evil with good. These are all quotes from the New Testament. And um, to not get caught into the cycle of violence. Uh, and then to pray for your enemy, as, as Jesus commanded. I, I think it's, it's to do what Jesus did. This is almost Gandhian. Well, it, Gandhi got it from Jesus. Right. <laughs> and, and, and Martin Luther King got it from Martin, Gandhi. And, and, and Jesus, and, and Jesus, Jesus right, right. Okay, but let me, so therefore the perception they would say to you is that if we do that, we'll be destroyed. Right. We'll be destroyed because they have no respect for our life. Well, Jesus, I don't think was, uh, two things here, Charlie. One, one is uh, Jesus, when he was giving this uh, radical ethic to his disciples, wasn't giving it a sort of the practical way to run the world. Uh, on Good Friday, it didn't look like it was very practical for Jesus to, he could have called the legions of angels, he right. said, uh, but he chose not to. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, it's not given as practical advice. The second thing, however, is this. Um, I think it's a pretty sure bet that the majority of people aren't going to do this. <laughs> it's too radical for them. But kingdom people are called to do this. Well, there actually are and, some political people who are saying we should disarm. Um, yeah, and, and I don't think that I, 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 you know, I would be careful about, uh, and this is a major point of the book, translating this, this kingdom ethic that Jesus gives us into public policy. I know there's other parts of the, New of the New Testament, Romans 13, for example, where Paul has this theology about how God runs nations. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, nations are going to fight, and we can have discussions about just war and all that stuff, but I think kingdom people are called to a, a much more radical Calvary-looking uh, way of doing life. I want to remind people at home what you said, because uh, I want to have you come back, and we'll talk about a lot of these things in another session. This is from one of those sermons. You said, I believe a significant segment of American evangelical evangelicalism is guilty of nationalistic and political idolatry. To a frightful degree, I think evangelicals fuse the kingdom of God with a preferred vision of the kingdom of the world. For some evangelicals, the kingdom of God is largely about, if not centered on, taking America back for God, voting for the Christian candidate, outlawing abortion, outlawing gay marriage, winning the culture war, defending political freedom at home and abroad, keeping the phrase under guard in the Pledge of Allegiance, fighting for power, for prayer in the public schools and at public events, and fighting to display the Ten Commandments in government buildings. Fusing together the kingdom of God with the kingdom of the world is idolatrous. This fusion is having serious consequences for Christ's church and for the achievement of God's kingdom. That, in the essence, is your message. That's, that, that's the essence of the message, yeah. You also believe that we have forgotten what the Founding Fathers believed in, which was separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the world's greatest ideas. Uh, and and you know, to keep the, the uh, church and state separate, uh, my main concern is, is not for the states, for the church. Because when the, when the two aren't kept separate, the, the beauty of the gospel that we're called to proclaim gets compromised. And uh, it, it goes to the, the title of this book, The Myth of a Christian Nation. No, yeah, that but, was my next question. Go ahead. All right. So no, you, know, you go ahead. We're, we're on the same frequency here. Um, when people think that this is a Christian nation, in any significant sense, more than just sort of a descriptive thing, like, the, you know, what do people say when they're asked, you know, by pollsters, uh, but, but when, when they have this ideology that this is a Christian nation, see, this is why I, I just think it's so damaging to what the church is called to be. America is not a Christian nation? No. If, 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 if Christian means, what the word means is Christ-like. And there, there never has been a time when America has looked Christ-like. Now, we can sit and talk about whether it's better than average and does good policies, whatever, but it doesn't, you know, bless those who persecuted and turn the other cheek. You know, mm -hmm. We have this, uh, this slogan. It's all over the place. We've got to take America back for God. You know, Christians are always saying this. You see it on bumper stickers. Take America back for God. And the question I ask is, when exactly was it for God in any sort of distinct sense? Uh, where were the good old God days? Was that before or after we imported three, three to six million blacks and, and got wealthy on, on, on the, the, the blood of their backs? Was that before or after we slaughtered Native Americans and broke every tree we went into? You see, when you, when, you, when you tag that as Christian, now you justify people who reject America. Uh, you justify them rejecting Christianity. Uh, you justify them rejecting Christianity. Well, they would say that. Let's assume they would say, uh, we are a Christian nation, but that was an unchristian thing to do. Yeah, see, that's... And that, that's part of our history that we reject. And, and, and then we do this little gymnastics thing of, you know, you, you have to really search hard for the times when America has been Christian in any sense of looking like is, Jesus. Is, it's is a nation. Is America any more a Christian nation than it is a... Uh, 
a Jewish nation? Well, it, it's a nation, and it's increasingly pluralistic, and uh, you know, it does good things, and sometimes it does bad things, and it's pretty par for the course. And but it and, is not identified with any particular religion. religion. I, well, it, you know, it, it carries out over Judeo-Christian values. But those people would say, look. You know, the people who came here to found this country were coming, A, because they were trying to r run from a religious persecution. Sure. They clearly wanted and had a, a strong feeling the about last thing the they power wanted was of the, the state. They yeah. didn't want a theocracy, yeah, yeah. And, uh, no, but theocracy is part of the what is at the heart of some of the conflicts in the world today. It is theocracy. That's Bel exactly people right. People who don't look to Christianity but look to other religions to believe they're acting in God's will. When you when you, you ask take, suicide bombers, why are they doing this? In part, it's, I'm doing God's will. God's will is a different God. And so much of the bloodshed in history has been because that's the majority of it, because you know God's on our side and God's for our tribe and God's for our nation, and all of that goes directly against the the teaching of Jesus. Instead of killing your neighbor in God's name, uh, you're to love your neighbor. Um, you know, throughout church history, if 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 the Bible doesn't teach us this, and it should, but if the Bible doesn't, history should teach us that when Christians get in power, it's no better than when anyone else gets in power. It's just that we do it, in the, we, we do the persecution and whatever in the name of Jesus. Uh, and so it's in our interest to keep the two very separate. Gregory A. Boyd, The Myth of a Christian Nation at the Quest for Political Power is Destroying the Church. Uh, interesting because of his own political views and the call that he is making for America and for the Jesus that he sees. His other books include Oneness, Pentecostals, and the Trinity, Cynic, Sage, or Son of God, Letters to a Skeptic with his father, Edward K. Boyd, God at War, the Bible and Spiritual Conflict, God of the Possible, a Biblical Introduction to the Open View of God, The Myth of a Christian Nation uh, is this one. Thank you for coming. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Good. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.